Hello and welcome back. In Chapter 3 of the Bankers Masterclass series on reducing the risk of correspondent bank de-risking in association with Banking Circle, I'm Joy McKnight, editor of The Banker, and I'm joined again by Mitch Trahan, who's UK Head of Compliance and Money Laundering Reporting Officer at Banking Circle. Nice to have you back, Mitch. Thanks, Joy. Good to be back and welcome again to everybody listening. So we've been discussing a lot about the research that Banking Circle has done. Mm -hmm. What insights did you gather from respondents on how well the current solution is really working for them? There were positives and negatives in the responses that we received. So as mentioned in the previous chapters, 71% of our respondents felt that the global economy would really benefit from an alternative solution. And also three out of four felt that they lost customers in part due to the lack of access to fairly priced correspondent banking partners, and indeed out of fear of keeping those customers means that they themselves may be de-risked. De also, as mentioned before, costs have increased for three out of four of the institutions we spoke to. So then if you take that and look at the global providers, the number of active banks that provide this service, known as correspondent banks, Worldwide, that fell by, by about 22% between 2011 and 2019. And that means for people needing access, there's just less and less choice. And with de-risking continuing, these smaller banks and smaller non-bank finance institutions could find themselves being dropped by their providers with very little warning. In fact, 60%, and I was shocked by the 60% of the respondents who have been let go by their banking partners were given less than two months notice. And two in three have struggled to obtain new correspondent banking partners. So if you think of that little notice and difficulty finding new partners, it's easy to see why in previous chapters we mentioned people are having multiple relationships to, to secure themselves, but many are left without the necessary partners. And then firms tend to fail or they're bought by another firm who then look at the customer base and potentially de-risk that again. So the results that we're seeing are firms can fail, customers end up with no access to financial services for a period of time, remittance volumes start to fall, and then this knock-on impact is actually less and less payments and less and less income for all the parties involved in the chain. So there's still some challenges, obviously, out there, but now there's some alternative solutions in the marketplace. Um, but again, going back to the research, you know, with the banks and non-financial institutions that you spoke to, you know, are they accessing alternative solutions? How do they feel about it? Actually, less than half overall believe that there's good alternative providers for correspondent banking payments. Big disparity between what Northern Europe responded and Southern Europe. 65% in Northern Europe actually think there are good alternative providers for them. However, it's only 23% in Southern Europe that felt the same. When you talk about alternatives, there's no real alternative to the correspondent banking network. The correspondent banking network works because there's a bank somewhere at the top of the chain that has access to the clearing systems for that currency in that country. But where the alternatives are really starting to come through is in how providers provide those services to other firms. The only real alternative is that you have a bank that's really focusing on how to provide payments to other banks and financial institutions. I mean, if you think of all the, the major banks in the world, their, their main aim is to actually provide services directly to consumers and corporates directly. How many really are spending the time, energy and technology on just focusing on providing those services to other banks and other financial institutions? And to do that right, you really need to have very specific technology that works in that way, that allows you to provide services to other banks and financial institutions. They need very, very different things than corporates and consumers as a client base. And then the next thing you need is that risk knowledge, risk appetite, and real ability to understand the true risks within a correspondent banking relationship between provider and those that need that access to payment systems. So I think the bottom line here is there's no change to the correspondent banking network, but what there really is a much, much better way to do it, using expertise and risk and using technology for payments designed for other banks and financial institutions. 
And that's where banking circles coming in. Well, thank you so much again for your insights, Mitch. In the final chapter of this masterclass series, we will look at how this problem could be approached quite differently.